When I first read about Albania and decided to visit, the city of Saranda was where I intended to base myself for the longest period of time. Whilst it took me three years of living here to finally go there, it was well worth the wait. This coastal town in the south of Albania is arguably the most touristic in the country. It's no surprise that this is a highlight on many tourist itineraries, given that it boasts some incredible beaches, rich history with numerous interesting archaeological sites, and some incredible islands close enough to the shore that you can swim to. During the summer months, Albanians and Kosovars flock to the southern beaches in absolute droves, in addition to all the international visitors. It's a favoured spot by locals and foreigners alike. Whilst Greece has managed to market itself as an idyllic seaside destination, Albania has just as much to offer at a fraction of the price. Saranda is located very close to the Greek border in the southern region of the Albanian coastline. Being just 15 kilometres away from the island of Corfu, a mere 30 minutes on a ferry is all you need to arrive in Saranda from a flight with a budget airline. This, in addition to the ever-increasing number of cruise ships that arrive here, are causing tourism to grow year on year, quite dramatically, in this what used to be quiet seaside town. I'd been communicating for over a year with a lovely New Zealand girl who runs a travel information website about Albania. She lives in Saranda but is a bit of an expert on the entire region known as the Albanian Riviera. Upon arrival in Saranda, I decide to meet her at her favourite restaurant to discuss some ideas I had for filming with her in a future episode. As we sit down to eat, I notice that the entire restaurant is absolutely full and that every single person there was foreign. Turns out September is a pretty popular month for tourists in the south, whilst all the Albanians will tell you that summer leaves with August. Attracting a bit of attention with the film crew, a young couple from Denmark inquire as to what we're doing. I'm Andy. I'm 29 years old, and this is my lovely girlfriend, Camilla. Um, Camilla, and I'm 22 years old. Oh, yeah, nice to meet you from Denmark. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So what brings you all the way to Albania? Hmm? I don't know, actually. Well, we wanted to go on a vacation. Uh, and the typical vacation spots from where we come is like Spain, France, Italy, and so on. But uh, I don't know, we wanted something different. You know, we wanted an experience. Mm -hmm. But still on a budget that two students can afford. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly, yeah. exactly. So Camilla found this deal from one of the Danish yeah. travel agencies, and then we just hurried it up and, and booked it, and here we are. What has been your impression so far? It's a nice place. It's very different from Denmark. Well, first of all, the nature. I mean, Denmark is one of the flattest countries in the world, so just looking at mountains is, is wonderful. Yeah. So you've been here for three days, you've got four more days left. What are you going to see and do? Well, I'm going to see a lot of the bottom of beer glasses. We uh, talked about we have to go to the, uh, to the Blue Eye. Mm -hmm. You do? All, yeah, and we also talked about go to the UNESCO site. Uh, yeah. Madrid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Great, yeah. we'll be going there too. So. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we can go together and you can yeah. see our point of view. No, no, no. Do you want to? No, no. <laughs> you can come with us to Madrid if you want. We'd where, love to take you around there. When are you going? Uh, we're going... Pazneza, Kelly? Pazneza? Uh, the day after tomorrow? Uh, Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. So after throwing the idea out there of dragging them along with me, it didn't take too long to convince them that it would be worth their while. The next morning, I pick them up from the hotel and we begin our adventures around Saranda. Kursi Castle in Saranda. We have a beautiful view of the entire city and the mountains in behind. And I get to play tour guide today to the Danish couple that we met at the restaurant in Saranda. So I'm super excited to show them around and take them to a couple of wonderful places. 
everything from natural monuments to cultural monuments and even some ancient history. So without further ado, let's meet them again. Hello. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for bringing us. Yeah. I hope you enjoy today. Are you excited? Very much. I mean, it's so beautiful. What uh, are your expectations from today? What are you most excited about? The views. <laughs> well, I'm just getting around and seeing some of Albania that we wouldn't have seen on our own. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a perfect day, I'm sure. Excellent. We're visiting quite a few uh, really famous places around Saranda, including Samil, as well as the ancient city of Butrint. So it should be a little bit of everything for you today. And we'll also get to try some delicious Albanian food and things like that. So. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. Let's get to it. Yes. First, we arrive at Le Corsi Castle, built back in 1537 as a strategic point between Corfu and the ancient city of Butrint, which we will explore a little later in the episode. The castle features both the ancient walls and a range of tourist facilities which have been constructed with similar architectural styling in order to keep the vibe. From here, we can see all of the city of Saranda and the view is absolutely incredible. As such, it seems like the perfect place to give a bit of a rundown to my guests of the itinerary we will be following today, as well as get their first impressions of how the trip will progress. After savouring the landscapes and taking a few selfies, it's time for us to continue on. Now, the city of Saranda does boast one hell of a promenade and the central beaches are very easily accessible to all. However, the best beaches are a bit further off the beaten track. For this reason, the region is best explored by car, as this allows you to reach the more secluded and most beautiful sections of coast. Easily one of the most scenic spots is the beach of Pulbarda, or the White Chicken. It's a small stretch of sand and sea surrounded by striking rock formations. Like much of the Albanian coastline, it has a few bars and restaurants built into the cliffside, the owners of which also operate the sunbeds and umbrellas on the sand below. This is also a major difference between Albanian beaches and what I'm used to back home in Australia, where it's essentially illegal to construct anything along the beaches. The land is completely owned by the state and most people bring their own equipment to the beach. In Albania, you will generally need to pay to sit at the beach, with the price covering the rental of a beach umbrella and sunbed. Furthermore, the lack of regulation surrounding this practice makes it even more cumbersome. It can be a good idea to negotiate, but remember to always do so with a smile. Today we're going one step further, taking advantage of the lower visitor numbers to enjoy breakfast with a view and with the seawater lapping at our feet, whilst I get to know my new young Danish friends. Whilst many might choose to invoke images of communism, corruption and crime when they think of Albania, it's memories like these that I see when I close my eyes and think of my new homeland. Given that it's rather secluded, you might be surprised to hear that this beach is actually quite well known. However, not as famous as that of Xamil and its three easily accessible islands, which just happens to be the next destination on our itinerary. The perfect place to make the most of the 300 sunny days that can be found each year in this region. Xamil is a village and renowned stretch of beach located south of Saranda on the way to the historic ancient city of Butrint, which we will also be sure to explore. Once it's time to leave Pulbadra Beach, we make our way to a larger, though more crowded site. At Xamil, there are a lot more facilities for those kinds of tourists who find it a little more difficult to entertain themselves, such as jet skis, paddle boats and snorkeling, just to name a few. We're hoping to catch up with a few more tourists as we wander around, too. So I am with my Danish friends here in Xamil, one of the most popular tourist destinations here in Albania. And as you can see, there are plenty of other foreigners around enjoying the sunshine here in September. There are a couple of islands behind us. So we actually had the idea, since there are these really cool paddle boats, I've never been on one, have you? Neither. No. no. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's try this for the yeah. first time then. Let's go. We can have first time experiences here in Albania. So we're going to take a paddle boat, head out to the islands and just enjoy the sunshine that's still here in September. They just looked so cute that we had to give the paddle boats a try. They make for a good and inexpensive way to enjoy the nearby islands without having to swim too far or get any of your personal belongings wet. Although, be aware, you do need a fair bit of leg strength to operate these things, especially for long periods of time. We just stopped up 
the back of the boat because the water was so enticing. And it's beautiful. What do you think? This is one of the most beautiful places I've ever went to the water. <laughs> what an endorsement right there. Yeah. And I've actually went quite a few places. Yeah. Yeah. So how many countries have you traveled to? I actually think I've went to 35. This 35. is my number 35. Oh wow, it's yeah. a milestone for you then. Yeah. And so how does it compare to other places you've been? It's in the top five, I would say. Nice. Yeah. And so is this what you expected when you came to Albania? I've done a little research, but I don't think you can... Like, you need to get to the place to find out how it really is. Yeah, I think yeah. it's the kind of place that's so beautiful that you can see nice pictures and everything, but you exactly. really can't understand it no, until you're here. No, and That's why we're here! <laughs> Heading back to our paddle boat, we continue on to the island so we can take a moment to sit in the water, rest our legs after paddling so hard, and try to get to know some other foreigners that are around. It's not long before I run into another travel blogger and her husband, who specialise in particular in just ducking away for the weekend to places you'd normally not think to go. This week, Albania was their chosen destination. So first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Alexandra. I'm from Australia and I've been living here for five years. I'm now making a documentary slash reality show about Albania from a foreign perspective. And so I understand that you're a travel blogger? Yes, we have a small travel blog um, called The World in a Weekend. Yeah. And the idea is that uh, we're going to travel to every country in the world, but because we work full time, we can only come here for like a couple of days. So, so we're here Thursday through to Sunday. We're here three days really, and we're going to try and see as much that we can and really get a good taste of Albania. Great. So how did you first hear about Albania? It's on the list, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, so we've done Italy, we've done Croatia, Slovenia, we did Montenegro last year, so we've been kind of working our way towards it. Um, but like Croatia was kind of like the sexy place 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Then Montenegro and Couture became like really popular three, four years ago. So we're kind of thinking Albania is kind of the next undiscovered little gem. Absolutely. Um, and everyone knows about Greece and Italy. So uh, yeah, we're trying to get here before everyone else discovers it and yeah. see what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. And so, as you can see, there are a few tourists around, but considering how beautiful this place is, are you surprised that tourism isn't a bigger industry here? Well, definitely. When we were researching, um, it was a landscape that really kind of mm. got us excited. From the beaches to the canyons and the mountain trails. Sorry. It, it's really Instagrammable, but at the same time, like, um we did a little research about Albania's history and it's a very isolated nation, yeah. so especially like it was communist, but it wasn't really with the Soviets, it wasn't really Western Europe, so um, no one really knew about it. And there's also, I know there's been a lot of economic problems here, but it seems to be kind of turning around. And like, we were just driving down from Tirana last night, but you can see there's like loads of hotels and um, huge wedding palaces and stuff like that. So it right. feels like it's kind of getting itself ready for tourism. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even like looking on like things like hotels.com and TripAdvisor, a lot of those places aren't there yet. So it's kind of like the infrastructure's there, but like they've not really advertise themselves to the world which is kind of exciting but mm. understandable given some of the history of the country and stuff. How cool are these people? So adventurous and free-spirited, keen to make the most of their free time without excuses. I had the great pleasure of meeting up with them again in Tirana a few days later and got to know more of their inspirational story including how the girl once took a 17-hour flight from London to Perth, Australia. Talk about travel dedication. After mucking around a bit more, frolicking in the sea and sand, I sit down with my new Danish friends to have a bit more of a chat. So we've made it out to one of the islands on the paddle boat and we're just sitting here relaxing in the sun. What do you think? This is perfect. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. So this is amazing. Even, even though it's, it's a bit touristy, it's not too touristy. Yeah. I think there's a reason why there's a lot of tourists here, you yeah. know? Like, it's not a well-kept secret in Albania. No. There are plenty of secret beaches that you could attend to, but here you've got a few more services, a few more activities, and things like that. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about where you're from and what tourists could see there and how it compares to here. So we're from Denmark, which is basically an old flat country. So just having the hills and the mountains around here is a huge difference. Yeah. And amuse us a lot. Yeah. So, so one of the, the main attractions in Denmark is, you know, the cities. Most of the tourists only go and see Copenhagen, 
But if you go to the countryside, I mean, it's 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 the, a whole different from this. In Denmark, it's all like beautiful little rolling hills and so on. So us for us coming here with the mountains and the crystal clear blue water, I mean, it's it's like paradise. This compared to you have beaches in Denmark, though, yeah, right? We do, yeah, we do, but not with turquoise water. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. And you're lucky if it's hot enough that you can stay in for a while. I was gonna say a it few must days be a year. A little bit colder, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. This summer I went to the beach in Denmark one time. And I was there for an hour, then I was freezing, and then I went over again. <laughs> so that's the Danish summer, maybe two weeks. Yeah, but we do have a lot of lakes that are popular to swim in, and they get hotter. So yeah, you can well, spend a day by the water. We have a lot of lakes too. So. <laughs> <laughs> was it okay? You can do it again. Do it again. <laughs> Having now had plenty of time to work on our tan with the best hours of sunlight behind us, it's time for us to move on to the ancient city of Bukrint, a prominent tourist attraction, UNESCO World Heritage Site and key archaeological monument for understanding the history of the entire region. Heading further south from Ksamil away from Saranda and almost right on the Greek border, we inch closer and closer to Bukrint National Park, which is home not only to the ancient ruins, but also to a range of landscapes including islands, marshes and freshwater lakes spread out across both hilly terrain and vast open plains, encompassing more than 9,000 hectares of land. Focusing on the ancient city, it quite literally is prehistoric. Whilst confirmed evidence of settlements date back to 8th centuries BC, there are archaeological artefacts that suggest settlements go back as far as the 12th century BC and possibly even beyond. Known in Latin as Buthrotum, the city used to belong to the ancient Greeks before being turned over to the Romans. It played an important role throughout the ages, though its prominence and maintenance waxed and waned. There are still archaeological objects being discovered here today. approach the entrance to the ancient city, I can't help but acknowledge something that has always fascinated me. Albania is full of eucalyptus trees. This particular type of tree is native to Australia and famous for being both the preferred home and the staple food in the diet of the native animal, the koala. With only 15 species of the tree found outside of the land down under, I just find it absolutely bizarre that there are so many here in Albania especially considering the size of them that indicates they haven't been planted recently. This right here is a eucalyptus tree, which is actually native to Australia. Really? Yes. Oh. Like, That's no funny. joke, one of the first things I noticed was like, this tree is native to Australia. What is it doing here? And this is not new. This no, has no, been no. here for a long time. Big roots. And this is what koalas eat from. So the eucalyptus leaves is the only thing that koalas can actually digest. And funnily enough, it has a, an effect on them, like a hypnotic kind of effect. And so they sleep for 21 hours a day, they eat these leaves for three hours, and then they sleep for another 21 hours. What a life. Because they're Can super high. some of those leaves? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't have the same effect for us. But so when I first moved here, I had all these like clip-on koalas. It's like a typical souvenir from Australia. Yes. And I went all around Tirana, leaving these koalas in the leaves of the eucalyptus trees. <laughs> I still have no idea how they ended up here and how they got here so so long ago, yeah, yeah. considering like Australia was only inhabited by white people like for 300 years. So that looks probably more than 300 years old. But so this is a eucalyptus tree. That's a eucalyptus. Like these are all eucalyptus trees all right of here. Them. So all these trees. All of these. These should have koalas in them. Yeah. But Let's we're in Albania, <laughs> not Australia, so we don't have koalas. As we progress further into the park, we arrive at the handicrafts shop and peruse the offerings from the local community, having a chat along the way. As I explain the project I am doing in yet another typical show of Albanian hospitality, we begin to receive a few gifted souvenirs. So here we have some... Fig? Is it like figs? Yeah, these are dried figs. Everything here is handmade, she said. Uh, this is like... This is actually really good. This is a fig paste. Um, I highly recommend it. I think we eat that in memory as well. Like, uh, Fienestanger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is uh, organic honey. 
The pomade lips and the skin is from honey pomade. Ah, Aloe vera, huh? propolis, red gem, liqueur, olive, raki albania. <laughs> you want some raki? No, we're not any. <laughs> he already had. <laughs> too much, too much raki. <laughs> This is a great place to pick up some local produce, crafts and other little trinkets to take back home and remember your trip by. Or for stocking up on gifts for friends and family back home, all the while supporting the local community. Next we head towards the first key area of the ancient ruins, the amphitheatre. Along the way, Andy and Camille are asking me questions that, as the tour guide, you would expect me to know. So just over here we have the amphitheatre, the old amphitheatre. And it's pretty cool, like you can sit down and like sort of get an idea of what it would have been like to be either part of the audience or on stage way back when this was an actual city. And how, how much way back is that? How, how old is this? Do you know? Can, uh, can you wait until I read yeah. and then I can find out? Sorry, sorry, just forget about it. Forget I asked. <laughs> Thankfully, the park administration offers a lot of information from the signs at each major point in the site to the brochures at the entrance offered in multiple languages, audio guides, one of which features my voice, and even the possibility of taking a tour around the park with a guide well-versed in your native tongue. So yeah, you can see like there's like um, the upper echelons of the theatre so that like no matter what was happening at the front, people could see. And I mean, people were entertaining themselves from back in the third century before Christ. So. We're talking about like more than 2,000 years ago. It's pretty crazy that like we have the same kind of design today, right? Yeah. So why don't we go over there and maybe have a sit down and... Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah? I feel like it. Yeah. If you like, I can sing for you. And see you on show. <laughs> I would like that. <laughs> Who knows, maybe you're the new Beyonce. <laughs> The amphitheatre is believed to have been built around the 4th century BC, once the city had grown in importance in the region, with the bathhouses and temples erected nearby. And it's so quiet here. Hello! Hello! <laughs> Hello. Romans! <laughs> Let's watch a gladiator fight! I come to bear Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you can even, even now hear the acoustics of this place. So, as you speak, you can hear all the voices coming back to you. And this yeah. is not even like how it, how it was at the time. So you can see why it's built this way. Not only is it great for the audience to see whatever's happening here, but it keeps the sound contained. So the acoustics are fantastic. So actually, when I came to Boutrin the first time, I didn't want to pay for a guy. Uh. So I just kind of like, dragged along with a group of people that were walking through and I was like, oh, that's super interesting. I do that too when I travel <laughs> <laughs> on a budget. Unfortunately, I don't speak German, so I can't join that group. Nine. Do you guys speak German? Nine. Nine? Nope. Like, nine. 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 <laughs> I had friends in school. Uh-huh. I, I, Not uh, that I speak it. <laughs> I studied Japanese at school, so tell me how that's useful that's cool. going to be in life. Yeah. Konnichiwa. Was that Japanese? Yeah. Konnichiwa. I think you could say many sounds telling us it's Japanese. <laughs> Arguably one of the most iconic features of the Butrint National Park are the mosaics found at the Baptistry of Butrint. These are particularly well preserved given the Baptistry was constructed in the 6th century AD. So this is likely to be because they were not excavated until 1928. The mosaic floor is considered to be the most complex of any relic in existence throughout the Mediterranean region, with its iconography boasting twists and turns relating to both Christianity and aristocratic life, such as peacocks, vine leaves, grapes, all symbolising eternal existence, as well as a rather odd array of animals with exotic creatures that is suggested to symbolise the elite class of citizens who resided here. Whilst the mosaics are well preserved, this is because the park administration seeks to protect them, often covering them with sand to prevent further erosion and damage from the natural elements. Hi, hi. So, this has been the ancient city of Butrint. Did you know that this was here in Albania? Yeah, we did. We heard, we heard of it, yeah, and we very much wanted to come here, so we're so thrilled to have had the opportunity to come. Are you impressed by how well-preserved this is? 
Oh, very yeah. much. And oh, I yeah. also noticed how accessible it all is. Mm. Usually at museums, you're not supposed to enter or touch anything, but... <laughs> <laughs> but here you can. Yeah, very much. I mean, that's both a good and bad thing. Exactly. So right now, we don't have that many tourists here in Albania. Um, but you can imagine if people were coming through and every single person went like this, exactly, like this, exactly. then it starts to erode away. And you do see some parts that say do not enter or that are covered in sand. But I think probably tourists need to be aware that even though you can do it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should. No, that's yeah? not. Not if you want to preserve it well. Mm. So part of the reason that this is so well preserved is because there haven't been so many people coming through. Um, so I think it's really important that tourists remember that even if you're allowed to do something that you're not allowed to do somewhere else, that doesn't mean that you should forget your morals or your values when you're a tourist. Um, and you should probably respect the place just as well. Very much indeed, yeah. At this point, it's been a pretty long day and my guests need a bit of a break. So I leave them to drink a coffee whilst I continue exploring like the Energizer bunny that I am. After the crew handle the negotiations with a driver outside the Betrint complex, we head by boat to the castle of Ali Pasha, an Ottoman Albanian ruler who was born in Tepelena and a notable figure in Albanian history. Later that night, I reconvene with my Danish friends and we are joined by Anita, the New Zealander living in Saranda, to discuss how the day went. I'm really surprised because walking down here, it's really, really different to what I remember from when I was here in Saranda a few years ago. So yeah. Yeah. it seems to have changed a lot. There's a lot more along the boulevard, like night markets and stuff. Yeah, there is. There's few new restaurants. Yeah. It's changed quite a bit in the last few years, I think. For how many years have you been living here? Uh, for two years. Okay. So yeah. Seen a bit of a change. Yeah, yeah, That's interesting. kind of. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I think it was about two years ago that I was here. Yeah, it would have been around about August 2017 that I visited. So. Yes, yeah. yeah. Have you noticed an increased number of tourists here? Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. In August, it's the busiest time of year. Um, yeah. Like all the cruise ships stop, and there's thousands of people coming to the city. So, yeah, I think a that's a big difference as well because when I when I first moved here, we didn't have any cruises that stopped in Albania, oh, none really? whatsoever. They started yet? No, no, the ports weren't even able to handle them. So mm -hmm. that started, I think, in either 2016 or 2017. Right. Uh, and they were there was some cruises that stopped in Buras and some cruises that stopped in Saranda. Mm. And I think now they even stop in Flora, but I'm I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, wow. there, there was this huge boat yesterday that dropped the anchor out here, and then there was this this stream of tourists just running into the, to the harbour front yeah. mm. and, and we ended up uh, right in the middle of all of it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we were one with the pack. Yeah, nice. when you see them they're like a flock of sheep just yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> and they're on such a short schedule too they because they yeah. arrive in the yeah. morning and they have to leave in the and afternoon. They want to do some experiences while they're here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's great for the local tour companies though because 
when you have that limited amount of time, you want to make sure that you know the schedule and you can get yeah. back in time. And so yeah, the exactly. local tour operators, they're able to, you know, it's really get some good data. something with a cap and figuring mm. out where to go. Yeah. We yeah. also noticed that all of the, the locals had set up all their little table shops yes. al along the front. Yeah. So we had a look and it was, well, it was nice. Yeah. We found some cool stuff. It's good for the local economy anyway. So I just want to point out that it's quite funny that we're all sitting here tonight, mm -hmm. given that you just came for dinner, minding your own business, got attacked by a film crew, and me and Anita were filming, you know, the intro to her part, which is going to be filmed shortly. So I actually ended up taking them around today and mm -hmm. sort of showing them Saranda and Samir and Butrin. What did you think of everything that we did today? Right now we did so much that I just need a second to remember what we did. <laughs> yeah, but you know, like in general it's been a fantastic day. Yeah? Because like, I mean, we, we've had the chance to come out and see some things that we wouldn't have seen on our own. Like for instance, the, the beaches, the beach where we had breakfast, so beautiful, one of the most beautiful beaches we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we, we can agree on that. And we would have never come there if it wasn't for you. So it, it's been an absolute pleasure for us. The best part for me was jumping off the paddle boat into the water. <laughs> I don't know, I have a thing about that. That's because you didn't want to fall like I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gracefully fell, I turned it into a dive at the last second. <laughs> But definitely it was a fall, not a jump. <laughs> well, yeah, that island was cool. The island was cool. Was awesome. Oh, you went out to the islands? Yeah, we did. Yeah. One of the islands. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. some dude has set up some bar. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we got the most expensive beer. The most expensive, beer, expensive beer, beer we had so in Albania, yeah. <laughs> it was worth it. Mm -hmm. It was, it was. Back on my own the next day, I hear about a group of foreigners who are organising a clean-up at the beach. Keen and interested to participate, I make my way down to the foreshore to do my part in keeping Saranda clean. Turns out, they've gone a step even further and are actually scuba diving to clean up the sea. As I have previously mentioned, I travelled a lot through Asia and one of the things that I got to do while I was there was my scuba diving qualification. So I did my open water in Thailand in an island called Koh Tao and then I was able to do my advanced open water diver in Timor-Leste, East Timor. It was super fun and I have found out that there are some great dive sites here in Albania as well, from shipwrecks to caves. Uh, so any qualified diver can find something to do here. And we've been lucky enough to stumble across a diving excursion that's actually going to clean up the trash in the sea. So we're here today to go and clean up some trash, save some sea animals and have a great time while doing it. What an initiative! Luckily, I'm a qualified scuba diver, and as such, I can still help out. So, my name's Elise. I'm from California, but I was born here in Albania. Uh, I work in the Bay Area. I'm an embedded systems engineer. Can you tell me a little bit about your history here in Albania? So, uh, I was actually born in Tirana, and my parents left during communism. They escaped to Italy, and then from there to the U.S., and I've been living there ever since. And I, I come back every now and then, you know, see the sights, do a bit of diving. Nice. Mm -hmm. How long have you been diving for? So I've been diving for 10 years now. Oh wow, so quite some time. And oh, yeah. what qualification do you have? So I have uh, advanced open water, a rescue diver, and wreck diver. Oh nice, so you're well and truly qualified. Very well. So can you tell me a little bit about what we're here to do today? So like every tourist town, uh, some people aren't uh, great with throwing away their trash. So we're here to, you know, essentially go into the ocean and clean up what shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And so what do you expect to find when we go diving today? So I've never cleaned it up before, but I have found some odd things. Everything from the back end of a car, like wow. car tires, oddly enough, I have no idea how they get out there, but they're there uh, and very difficult to get out of the uh, silt. So uh, that and of course, small refuse like cans and bottles, things like that. Yeah, lots of plastic and stuff like that we're expecting to find, I guess. Most definitely. And so how often do you come back to Albania? Uh, I try to come to Albania once a year. I have you know, my yearly vacation and I'll either take it in Europe or I'll come through here. And so what have been your impressions coming back and seeing Albania change over time? The, the most striking one has been the roads. Mm -hmm. So when I was young and I came here with my family, the roads were literally dirt roads with rocks on them and you couldn't roll down the windows because the car would just fill with dust. 
Uh, and so coming back and seeing modern roads that essentially lead everywhere, it's, it's a big change. And it really opens up the whole country. Mm. And realistically, I'd never been to Saranda until two years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Same. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'd been to, you know, of course, the capital, where the you know, airport goes right into, but it is difficult to leave the capital because of, you know, the lack of infrastructure. Right. But now that it's all there, it's real easy to explore all the different sections. Do you travel quite a lot to other countries as well? Yeah, so every year uh, I have about three weeks that I just spend kind of touring around. Mm -hmm. So I've hit everywhere in Europe, parts of North Africa. And I haven't hit Asia yet, which is the next on my list. Okay, so given that you have traveled quite a bit, obviously trash is a problem everywhere in the world, not just here in Albania. Yeah. But how would you rate the problem compared to other countries? So the... The trash here is not as bad as surprisingly where I live. In California, in the Bay Area specifically, there's a huge homeless problem and a huge trash problem that's associated with it as well. So, the, especially in tourist towns like this, the lack of homelessness and the, the availability of you know, trash cans along the street usually bring the street trash down quite a bit. The stuff that you find in the ocean here is usually not someone with the intention of throwing trash in the ocean. It's someone out there playing with an you know, empty bottle of water, throwing it around, and it's getting pulled away by the current and eventually sinks. Yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. Okay, so hopefully we can clean up some, some trash today and get lots of stuff out of the ocean so we can save the turtles and save the dolphins and save all the fish. Do you not know about the, uh, the trash tag? The hashtag? No. Oh, you're gonna gotta, you have to look it up after this. What's the hashtag? So it's a it's a hashtag that's kind of popular in the U.S. It says uh, trash uh, hashtag trash tag, and it's ah. just people go out and they clean up. They get a whole bunch of uh, trash bags and they just clean everything up and they just snap how much they cleaned. Though this is not an activity that everyone could participate in, as it does require you to have undergone the appropriate training. Should you arrive in Albania with qualifications, you'll be delighted to find a range of dive sites, including some incredible shipwrecks and even an underwater marine park. As we get kitted up, I am aware that I'm less likely to see interesting fish today and more likely to see tyres that have been thrown off boats around the nearby port. So I've just been down there. There is quite a bit of trash down there. Uh, as you can see, we pulled out quite a lot of boat tyres. Now, those don't float, so they've just been dropped and left there. And they actually said they did this about three weeks ago and cleared all of them out. So this is what we've been able to collect in just three weeks' time here in the Saranda port. So it's great to see that these guys are actually doing something about it and getting rid of them because these do not belong in the sea. Um, the visibility is pretty poor down there, so it's very hard to find the rubbish through all of the silt and dirt down there, but they're doing a pretty good job. What a wonderful time I have been having in the seaside town of Saranda. Meeting new friends, discovering the city, soaking up the beautiful landscapes, the sun's rays, exploring the history of the area and even partaking in some water sports. Wow, there really is a lot to do. However, before making my way back to Tirana, there's one final place I absolutely must visit. Suriyakalto, or the Blue Ice Spring, is an incredible natural phenomenon with crystal clear water constantly pumping up from the depths of the unknown. We have arrived at possibly one of the most popular tourist attractions in Albania, known as the Blue Ice Spring, or Suriyakalto. And just behind me you can see the spring with amazingly clear water. It is very, 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 very cold. Basically what happens is really, really cold water just pumps up and pumps up and pumps up from the bottom. And you can actually jump in from the platform up here if you're game enough. And so I might give that a try today. And game enough I was, although not quite at first. Sorry. I've done it before, so I blame the cameras, but I wasn't about to chicken out completely. Three, two, one, whoa! After having done it once, I couldn't wait to do it again. Three, two, one, whoa! Funnily enough, 
My experience with the Blue Eye Spring acts as a good metaphor to the advice I would give regarding travelling to Albania. For many people, at first, it looks scary, like jumping into the unknown. But actually, once you get past the unnecessary worries, you can see the beauty of the reality of the place. Once you've taken that first leap, it's difficult to remember what it was you were so concerned about in the first place. Take a second leap and you'll be hooked. When I first visited the Blue Ice Spring a few years ago, it was a bit different. This platform had a railing which you could hold on to, there was no souvenir shop, and the overall experience had a rough-around-the-edges vibe. This is something important to remember about Albania. It's always evolving, always changing. Many of the Albanians who live abroad return for summer holidays, but also many of them don't. This is a real shame because it doesn't give them the opportunity to update their perspective of the country. I dare say nowhere in the world will you see a nation that has had so much rapid and expansive progress in a period of just 30 years. Just like me at the Blue Ice Spring, even though I jumped before many years ago, the idea of returning was still scary. What if it was different to how I'd experienced it before? What if it had changed, but not for the better? My advice, just take that leap. Jump into it with all your heart. Because I dare say, once you come to Albania, or once you return to Albania, it's most likely that it's your old memories that will start to seem a little bit alien. With a big smile from Albania.